Good morning. Welcome to the public worship of God this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us or um, participating in worship at home. We're delighted to have you with us. There are a few announcements in the bulletin. There's a reception for our graduates following worship this morning, and we hope you'll stay a couple minutes and share a cupcake with Melanie and her family as we celebrate her graduation from high school. Um, our friend and brother Dick Caldwell died to this world and entered life triumphant Tuesday evening. There are two different <laughs> mentions of the service in the bulletin. The one you want to pay attention to is on the back of the bulletin insert. This has the correct time um, for the calling hours, which are from 10 to 11, and the service begins at 11 o'clock in the sanctuary. Are there any other um, announcements for this morning? Let us then worship God. I'd like, you to please, I'd like you to please join me in a responsive call to worship. Loving God, we come today yearning for that which is trustworthy. We come as those needing to be surprised by your unexpected answers. We come remembering how you, O oh Lord, work through things we dismiss and overlook. You grant us new eyes to see your works, gracious God, and new hearts to love the world as you love us. Lord, we come this day having seen the miracles of everyday creation in our world. We have enjoyed both the bright sunshine and the gentle rains. We have marveled over the beauty of flowers and the complexity of your creation. Make our hearts ready to receive your word for us, that we may go forth from this place ready to joyfully serve you all of our days. Amen.
Scripture reminds us that our sins are like scarlet, but we are invited to confess those sins to a God who has always seen beyond our limitations, faults, and failures. Let us turn again to our God of abundant grace and ready mercy. Patient Lord, you know how we are. We let the frustrations and worries of our lives overcome us. Our hearts seem to buckle under the weight of anger and confusion, and we turn away from you, sure that you can do nothing to alleviate our strife. How foolish we are. How faithless we are. Please forgive us. Help us to learn that you are actively involved in our lives, not as a puppet master, but as a creative co-worker, seeking healing and hope, not only for each of us, but for the whole world. Make us into disciples of peace and compassion. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let go of your fears and doubts. God pours God's love on you, in you, and through you to others. Be at peace and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And I invite you to stand now and greet one another from where you're standing with the peace of Christ. Today, we honor and give thanks for our graduates. And um, we have with us Melanie Groff, who is graduating from Lake Forest High School. She is the daughter of John and Jeanette and sister of Emily. Congratulations, Melanie. <laughs> we also have in our congregation Leanne Glendenning, granddaughter of Lisa Hart, who's, who's making the move from Central Academy Middle School up to Milford High School. She's not able to be here today. So please uh, remember her in your prayers of Thanksgiving and maybe send her a card. There is a uh, college. Now, someone tell me how to pronounce this. B-E-L-O-I-T. Beloit, is that how you say it? Okay. Every year, it publishes its mindset for the incoming freshmen. It's to tell the faculty and the staff what the people coming into the school in the fall have experienced in their lives. Because, let's face it, most of them are much older and have no clue. So, here is what is going on with the class of 2021. Graduating high school seniors that will be entering college in the fall. And I'm not reading all of them because it's a long list. Their classmates could include F. Eddie Murphy's Zola and Mel Gibson's Tommy or Jackie Ivanko singing down the hall. They are the last class to be born in the 1900s, the last of the millennials. millennials. Were you born in 1999? What year were you born? You were. Well, how'd that happen? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't need to know. Anyway, okay. This says mindset list for the class of 2021. Well, anyway, okay. They are the first generation for whom a phone has been primarily a video game, direction finder, electronic telegraph, and research library. eHarmony has always offered an algorithm for happiness. Peanuts comic strips have always been repeats. The Panama Canal has always belonged to Panama. And Macau has always been a part of China. They were never able to see a Montgomery, they were never able to use a Montgomery Ward catalog as a booster seat. They have always been searching for Pokemon. 
Dora the Explorer and her pet monkey Boots helped to set them on the course of discovery. The seat of Germany's government has always been back in Berlin. JetBlue has always been a favorite travel option, but the Concorde has always been permanently grounded in their lifetime. By the time they entered school, laptops were outselling desktop computers. They, there has never been a Coliseum in New York, but there has always been a London Eye on the Thames. One out of four Major League Baseball players has always been born outside of the United States. Carl Sagan has always had his own crater on Mars. A movie scene longer than two minutes has always seemed like an eternity. They have only seen a checker cab in a museum. As toddlers, they may have taught their grandparents how to Skype. Nolan Ryan has always worn his Texas Rangers cap in Cooperstown, while Steve Young and Dan Marino have always been watching football from the sidelines. Justin Timberlake has always been a solo act. The Mars Polar Lander has always been lost. Women have always scaled both sides of Everest and rode across the Atlantic. Bill Clinton has always been Hillary Clinton's aging husband. And paleontologists have always imagined dinosaurs with colorful plumage. Does that describe you pretty well? <laughs> I'd like to ask Melanie, uh, entering um, as a freshman in college in the fall, to come up and tell us a little bit about her plans. Thank you, Pastor Diane. You're welcome. <laughs> all right, so this summer I'm going to be working a lot because, as we all know, college is kind of pricey. <laughs> I'm going up to, to the University of Delaware in the fall. I'm going to major in mechanical engineering. Cool. Very good. Thank you. A great school. Um, Melanie also applied for the Martin Luther King Scholarship of the Milford Area Ministerial Association, MAMA. And uh, she had to write an essay, which was excellent. And so on behalf of MAMA, I am very happy to present Melanie with this $1,000 scholarship. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for all of the milestones of our lives and all the people who have helped to get us there. We thank you for Melanie and all of her hard work and her insightful thinking and her good humor and her love of the arts, everything about her. And we thank you for her family and this church community that helped to raise her in the way that she should go. Bless her as she enters the University of Delaware. Give her wisdom and courage and lots of fun as well as lots of learning. Help her to be the person that you created her to be and help us all to support her every step of the way, as well as every graduate on our list. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, Melanie. Today's scripture reading comes from the New Testament, Mark 4, 20, verses 26 to 32. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet, when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch, can perch in its shade. 
stay right there. I forgot one very important component of our celebration. Kelly, would you like to come up, please? Even when I write things down, I forget them. So sad. <laughs> so Melanie and I have worked together in Sunday school for over a decade now, right? And uh, <laughs> you are. <laughs> so on behalf of the church, the members, the friends, and deacons, I present to you this week. And the wrapping credit goes to Gail Burgess, who also made sure that it was in the link for school colors. <laughs> Melanie was always the person to answer a question, and it's goal-oriented, and I have no doubt that she will continue to represent her family and this church family well as she moves forward to the next time. Congratulations. Yeah, Melanie was always the one that put me through my paces in the children's story, too. I soon learned not to ask any questions. <laughs> but she would come up with questions of her own. <laughs> they were always challenging. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> my sister, Kathy started her working life as a computer programmer analyst for Hallmark Cards in Kansas City around 1981. This was more than 10 years before Frank and I bought our first desktop home computer. And so my computer experience was limited to the um, one unit in math class that I had in about eighth grade. Needless to say, it was limited. And still, I was interested in her new job and a good sister, so I would say, what did you do at work today? And then she'd her, try her best to explain it to me. When I didn't understand what she was saying the first time, she'd try another approach, and then another, and then another, until finally we both gave up and talked about something else. Some things are just too big too complex or too foreign to the listener's experience to be explained in just a sentence or two, or in one example or metaphor or parable. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, Jesus uses three parables to describe the kingdom of God, and all three have agricultural imagery for this purpose. First is the parable of the sower. This is the most well-known of the three. The story begins, listen to this. A farmer went out to scatter seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where the soil was shallow. They sprouted immediately, but then dried up because they had no roots. Other seed fell among the thorny plants, and the thorny plants grew up and choked out the good seed, and they produced nothing. Other seed fell into good soil and bore fruit. You have probably heard more than one sermon on this parable of the sower, and I know that I have preached more than one myself. Bottom line, be good soil. Listen to God's word, receive and live its message so that others learn the truth of God's grace through you so that you bear fruit 30, 60, or even 100 fold. If that was all there was to building God's kingdom, we could get carried away and think the whole enterprise depended on us. It would be easy to get puffed up with self-importance or despondent under the weight of the responsibility. But Jesus isn't finished yet. The second kingdom parable Jesus tells goes like this. This is what God's kingdom of this is what God's kingdom is like. It's as though someone scatters seed on the ground, then sleeps and wakes night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, but the farmer doesn't know how. 
The earth produces crops all by itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full head of grain. Whenever the crop is ready, the farmer goes out to cut the grain because it's harvest time. The father of the groom was crying. He was standing in the corner of the church watching his son lead the wedding party in prayer just before the wedding rehearsal started. Gathered with his friends around the baptismal font, the groom thanked God for the gift of his bride and prayed that he would be a generous husband. He also asked that he would be a faith-filled father so that he could introduce his children to Jesus once they were born. The priest noticed the young man's dad quietly shedding tears over in the corner and walked over to him. Dad pointed to his son and said, I am so proud of him. He is a man of faith. He loves his fiance and his friends, and I know he will make a loving father and husband. And now look, he's leading his friends in prayer. Where did he learn to do all this? And without hesitation, Father Michael Renninger said, he learned it by watching you. What the dad didn't know was that during the premarital counseling, the groom had shared with his priest that the dad was his hero. Everything he said that was important in his life, pretty much he learned from his father. He learned by watching his dad kneel at the son's bedside every night while they prayed together. He learned by watching his dad lead the family in prayer before meals, even if they were in a restaurant. He watched his dad receive communion on Sunday and feed the hungry with his Bible study group. He noticed that his dad spoke to his mother with kindness and respect and that they worked as a team in raising their children. And so when dad pointed to his son and asked the priest, how did he learn to do all this? How did he grow into such a fine person? The priest could honestly and without reservation say, he learned it by watching you. Father Renninger says of this second parable in Mark 4, Jesus gives us an image that is meant to draw us into a mystery. The parable presents an invitation for us to participate in the growth and spread of God's kingdom. Yes, we are called to be hardworking seed planters, but we are also called to be humble, grateful, growth watchers. We plant the seed, but the growth happens in a way that is mysterious to us. Do you remember the little paper Dixie cup? Probably almost all of us in kindergarten, first grade, were given a little cup, a little pile of dirt, and a bean. And we planted the bean in the dirt, gave it a little water, and waited. And watched and waited, maybe a little more water. Some of us, I know, drowned our beans. But if you did it right, <laughs> a little more water, and then watched as a little tiny green shoot popped out of the crack in the soil. We knew that we needed to keep the soil moist. And then we knew that we needed to put it in a windowsill or someplace where the whole thing could get light. But when it comes to the actual process of how the roots reached down and how the sprout shot up, it was like magic, a mystery. Likewise, the growth of God's kingdom is a mystery. The growth, whether in the individual Christian or in the beloved community, the growth comes from God. The parable of the growing seed serves as a cautionary tale, guarding against the pride that lurks nearby whenever we are tempted to become good soil by our own excellent efforts. Lamar Williamson writes in his commentary on Mark, the parable is significant whenever and wherever we Christians take ourselves and our efforts too seriously, seeking by our plans and programs to bring the kingdom of God. Against such arrogant self-importance stands a subtle allusion to God's hidden presence and power. We do have kingdom work assigned to us. We are the planters. Our job is to scatter seed with wild abandon, 
living our lives in a way which exhibits the love and forgiveness of God, sharing our faith in all that we do and say and are. Seed planting is our responsibility. But growth, when and how that seed germinates and takes root and grows, that is in God's hands. As we all know, not every seed takes root and flourishes in the same way or on the same timetable. Like some plants which don't bloom for the first year or more after which they are planted, sometimes we need to be patient, wait, and trust in God for a seed to bear fruit. Jesus then continues with this lesson. What's a good image for God's kingdom? What parable can I use to explain it? Consider a mustard seed. We've got to love this transitional section of the passage. You can almost see Jesus rubbing his beard and thinking, trying to think of a better or more complete way to explain the kingdom of God. It sounds like he's thinking out loud and reminds me of my sister trying to explain what a computer programmer analyst does on a typical day. Let's mustard seed. A mustard seed. Why would Jesus compare God's glorious kingdom to a mustard seed? Mustard plants were common weeds. They grow underneath the soil and can easily and stealthily take over an entire garden patch. When, we, when a friend of mine came over a couple of years ago and, um, to drop something off or whatever, and she noticed that we had two Bradford pear trees in our, um, by our driveway. And she said, oh, you had Bradford pears. And I said, yeah, is there something wrong with that? Because I had no clue. And she said, oh, well, they're not considered to be the nicest plant. So I, I mean, I thought it was beautiful. There were two healthy big trees, nice white flowers in the spring, you know, provided shade, yada, yada, yada. So anyway, I looked it up online, and there was actually an article entitled, The Evil Bradford Pear. <laughs> Because I didn't know, but evidently they are prolific and invasive and choke out, you know, the natural cherry trees and dogwood trees, all those things we love. Anyway, so that's how the mustard seed works as well. If left unchecked, the mustard seed does not grow into a majestic tree, but becomes a large, scruffy shrub. A.J. Levine, author of Simple Stories of Jesus, writes, The mustard plants grow only a few feet high. Like many parables, this one is humorously satirical. The kingdom is like a shrubby, invasive bush. The parable suggests that the kingdom arises from an inconspicuous beginning, but grows miraculously. In choosing the mustard seed, Jesus is comparing the kingdom of God to an exceedingly tiny, apparently insignificant thing, which becomes, by the grace of God, something grand and hospitable. It's a place where the least expected are invited, nourished, and grow to be a blessing to others. Emerson B. Powery traces growth of rights of African Americans as an example of God's kingdom growing like a mustard seed when he writes, Analog analogously, one would never imagine a liberation struggle that began with a few escaped slaves would lead to insurrections that led to the abolitionist movement, that led to the Civil War, that led to Reconstruction, that led to the Harlem Renaissance, that led to the Civil Rights era. God's liberating reign has certainly become large enough that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Why use a weed as a metaphor for God's kingdom? Because the love and grace of God are more like a wild jungle than a manicured garden. They should not be pruned, but allowed to grow where they will.
where God wills. Thanks be to God for the promise of God's present and future wild kingdom. Amen. We come to the time in our service when we think about giving back, giving back to God, giving back to our community for all that we have been given. And so as um, Anne plays the offertory, I invite you to consider that question, how might I give back? And if you have a monetary offering you'd like to contribute, you may put it in the offering plate in the narthex on your way out or um, mail us a check or visit our website, fpcmilford.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Are there joys and concerns to come before God this morning? Of course, we'll want to remember Janice Caldwell in our prayers. Paige. Tim and Colleen, thank you. Um, David. Thank you, David. John. Thank you. 
And which grandson is that? He has, Danny has sciatica and gout. Okay, and then healing for Gary Long. Thank you. Yes, Carol. I heard Ernie Campbell is moving to Smyrna and what? Oh, in the 55 and older community. Okay, thank you very much. We'll ask prayers for his safe travel and good good experience in his new home. Sue. Prayers for Judy and her surgery. Yeah. Anybody else? I also ask that you continue to keep my brother-in-law, Dennis, and my sister in your prayers. Um, it's just a matter of time. So, peaceful passage. Sue. <laughs> it is. Hi, Olivia. <laughs> Olivia is going to be baptized here in August. I won't tell you which week, so you'll come every week. <laughs> is that all? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you hold us in the palm of your hands through all of life. And for this, we give you thanks. We thank you for entrusting us with the um, mission of scattering seed, of um, sharing your word and your love and your light with others. We pray that your love and light surround all of these that we mentioned today, that your healing, loving presence might be with them, and that whether that healing take the form of improved health or passage on to the next phase of life. We pray and know that you are with them. Give, give our loved ones comfort and peace and courage to face what comes ahead. We thank you for the gift of knowledge and, as I said before, milestones and um, moving on in life, new adventures, new challenges, new opportunities. We pray that you be with our graduates as they move forward in your plan for them. And we ask that you help us to be your church to the very best of our ability, sharing your love and light from the heart of Milford and with all whom we meet. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who continues to teach his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On your way to uh, getting a cupcake, the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of God, the God of Jacob, protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all of your plans. And may the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and through all these things. Amen.